African desert, cursed by drought. Where life is pushed to the limits. An endless land driven by strife. There is no escape from the relentless sun and swirling dusts. But there is a secret hidden in these hostile plains. It takes just a few drops to spark the magic. The curse is broken and the dormant soils erupt into an array of color unmatched by any other on Earth. Transformed by the sun, a billion flowers unfold. This is Namakwa land. Africa's desert garden. A sea of flowers responds to the warmth of the sun, turning the rocks and beaches of South Africa's west coast into a paradise where not only the sands, but even the stones seem to come alive. Stretching from the Atlantic Ocean in the west, over sand dunes and massive plains, the splendor extends 100 kilometers inland until it meets an 800 meter high escarpment. Here in the hinterland, fields of flowers have transformed the desert plains into a palette of countless colors, shapes and sizes. Across these plains, Namaqualand has over 3,000 species of flowers. More than half occur nowhere else on Earth. This extravaganza of flowers is the result of a connection between Namaqualand's geography and weather. Nestled between the Cape Floral Kingdom in the south and the ancient Namib Desert in the north, Namaqualand boasts the most spectacular landscapes. On this abundance of spring will depend other forms of life. Ostriches are true Namaqualanders. This male is brooding a clutch which has just started to hatch. The chicks have a bountiful garden awaiting them. Meerkats are also typical residents of Namakwa land. Being so small, they must always have at least one century looking out for predators. Even now, in the full flush of spring, More recent inhabitants are the people who gave their name to this place, the Namas. As pastoralists, they've herded their flocks of sheep and goats across the flowers for centuries. Now in full bloom, Namaqualand is a hive of activity. The plants have bedecked themselves in bright and sweet-smelling flowers to seduce insects into pollinating them.
but with billions of flowers from thousands of species blooming at once, the competition for pollinators is intense. Vying for the attentions of their insect suitors, the flowers have evolved a brilliance of color and variety unmatched anywhere else on Earth. Some plants have taken a more literal approach to seducing insects. The beetle daisy mimics the shapes of its pollinator, enticing passing mates to join a beetle orgy that is merely an optical illusion. Other plants entice a select few with a rich but hidden reward. Over millions of years of living and evolving together, some plants and insects have forged a special relationship. The goat's horn flower offers thousands of tiny but highly nutritious oil droplets to its specially adapted partner. The oil collecting bee has long front legs specifically designed for inserting down the flower's oil laden horns. It gathers both oils and pollen to produce a rich mixture on which she will lay her eggs. She must visit other flowers for nectar to power her flight. Other flowers, like La Perusia, lay out landing strips to highlight their entrances. Only a long-tongued fly is able to reach La Perusia's deep well of nectar. The flower reaps its reward when the fly collects a face full of pollen and carries it away to fertilize other flowers. Despite living on energy-rich nectar, the flies are soon burnt out by their expensive hovering flight. Babiana flowers have landing lights only on the bottom petals to direct the angle of approach to its visitors. succulent leafed mazems have no nectar to offer, but they do have thick beds of pollen for monkey beetles to feast and mate upon. But rivalry is intense. The new arrival sends the first male into a frenzy of agitation. He will not tolerate competitors for his female. The clashing of spurs can be so violent that sometimes a male may break his rival's legs. The original male wins and the intruder must retreat, leaving the honeymoon pair to continue their orgy as they are slowly enfolded into the safety of their petal boudoir. But some insects are immune to plant seductive ploys. These immature foam grasshoppers are not after morsels of nectar or pollen. They want the whole flower. They need to triple their body size before they can breed. For the ostriches, too, the flowers are a rich source of food. And for the chicks, their arrival coincides with the spring bounty. From their perspective, the forest of flowers must seem like an impenetrable jungle full of dark secrets. They are being watched.
but the caracal's cover is blown, and now he must meet the parents. The caracal is a formidable predator, but now he's definitely out of his league. At dusk, the colors fade as the flowers close for the night, guarding their precious pollen from the dew. At night, there are strange moves amongst the flowers. The underground thieves are mole rats. These rodents spend their entire lives underground and now the abundance of rich juicy daisies presents an irresistible opportunity. Soon they have gorged themselves on the brief plenty. But in a nearby cave there are other stirrings in the underworld of Namakwa land. Trapped in the body of a larva for two years, an adult emerges for the culmination of her life. Like magic, the threadwing lacewing unfolds and prepares her bridal gown. then steps out to dance. A suitor waiting in the wings joins in the mating dance. faint moonlight, the hovering wings seem to mingle with shadows of the past. Ancestors of the Nama people held special rituals in these caves thousands of years ago. These will be the lace wings' final moments. Their dance is exquisite but tragically short-lived. Like the tumultuous Namaqualand spring. Within a few weeks the miracle flowering is over. As the sun increases its intensity, the fragile flowers begin to wither. The last of their energy is spent producing billions of seeds, their only insurance for the future. Harvester ants raid newly dried out daisies, dispersing the seeds as they begin to stock their larder.
the spring colours have gone, leaving a barren landscape. The meerkats emerge to a whole new challenge. Spring is over and now they have four new mouths to feed. Only three weeks old, the pups are up for the first time and will need to be fed for at least another two months. The Namas face a similar problem. They must find sufficient grazing for their animals. The ewes are returning to suckle their lambs, which were kept safe in makeshift enclosures overnight. As the land dries out, Namakwa sand grouse fly for miles in a daily quest for water. Each day's journey may take them a distance of 60 kilometers to find a drink. but the precious water is already turning to mud. Namakwa sand grouse are well adapted to this desert, but they must have water every day. Soon their thirst will take them to even more faraway sources. The Namas too travel far, deep into the mountains to find an ancient spring. In the stark hills of this increasingly arid land, the spring is a rare oasis. Their long climb finds sweet reward. But for all Namaqualanders, life will take a turn. Under the watchful eye of a sentry, the meerkats are surviving despite the barren terrain. With their powerful sense of smell, they are past masters at unearthing hidden treasures. Their pups are inexperienced at finding food and beg incessantly from the adults, who are still prepared to share their pickings. An armoured lizard takes in the early rays of the day. But it attracts unwanted attention. The meerkats will seize any chance for prey. At first, the stranded lizard plays dead. Then deploys its ultimate defense. Even these wily meerkats are defeated by the impenetrable ring of spines.
The meerkats delve ever deeper and finally strike gold. A scorpion is a prize with a ruthless sting. The sting can kill a child. Meerkats are immune to the poison. However painful, it's a substantial reward. Temperatures now soar to 40 degrees. It's been months since the last rains. The quiver trees seal off the heat with their shiny bark and waxy leaves. In the unforgiving summer heat, all life must adopt superior strategies to save water. But this is not enough. As a last resort, they amputate their own branches to reduce water loss. The relentless sun forces the meerkats into the shade. But for the guard, there is no relief. The heat now stirs up searing winds. Other plants have given up the fight to save water and now survive only as seeds. Their withered remains are shaken apart, releasing their seeds to be scattered by the wind across the desolate landscape. Whether on the wing of hot winds or on the backs of creatures, all seeds disperse, taking different paths to wait out their dormancy. Dried out irises and lilies take a less radical route. They abandon all life above ground and reabsorb their moisture into underground bulbs, where it's cool and safe from the sun. But in this dark underworld, the long toothed robbers are still on the prowl. The mole rats are stockpiling food to last them the summer. Soon the soil will be too dry and hard to dig more tunnels in search of sustenance and they will be totally dependent on their hoard of bulbs for both food and water. For the inhabitants of Namaqua land, summer has arrived with a vengeance. In the midst of this desolation, the foam grasshoppers are fat and preparing for their final transition to adulthood. Their new bodies burst through the hardened skin of the old.
After seven months of walking, they have at last grown wings. The meerkats are desperate for food, yet they will barely sniff these brightly coloured grasshoppers. It is their vivid coloration that protects the grasshoppers, signalling that they are highly toxic. A single grasshopper's poison could kill the entire meerkat family. The source of this poison is the milkweed, one of the few remaining plants that is still green. The grasshoppers assimilate the toxins by eating the branches that are loaded with a cyanide. There is virtually nothing edible left in Namakwa land. Most of the succulents protect their precious water by producing chemicals that will make them unbearably bitter. Or even deadly. Yes. This is an unforgiving sign that the Namas have overstayed their welcome. With no grazing left, they now pack their belongings. It will be a long and unforgiving trek. east out of Namakwa land to a plateau which will offer sweet, fresh grasses. They leave this land where there are no traces of its former garden. Now, Namakwa land is baked dry. Ostriches linger a little longer despite the searing temperatures. Soon, they too may need to leave. Even the succulent dwarf mesems on the quartz plains give up the struggle and reabsorb the water left in their soft leaves. Everything seems to have turned to stone. Hidden amongst the quartz pebbles, these hardy succulents fight the sun's rays with their reflecting silvery skins. The meerkats are frantic. They are too small to migrate. It's a race against time and every moment is costly, so to stay alive they wrestle with the baked land. Now all their food with vital moisture will come from underground. There is no more sharing. Now it's every meerkat for himself. Not even the pups are spared this harsh reality. The 
group's family ties are stretched to the limit. Every morsel is vital. They don't have a choice, they're trapped in this unforgiving land. Only a hundred kilometers to the west, life is very different. At the coast, the relentless heat is relieved by the icy Atlantic waters rising up against the shores of Namaqua land. Moisture in the air condenses into life-giving mists. The sun soon burns off the mist. But the mist will have left its mark on the thirsty vegetation, attracting many ostriches down to the coast. In contrast to the barren, desiccated plains inland, here on the coast the animals bathe in luxury. Travelling all the way from the Antarctic, the Benguela Current drives up a wave of icy but nutrient-rich waters onto the African coast. This is the perfect time for the marine animals to breed. Cape fur seal bulls squabble over territories and their females within them. The seal pups suckle furiously. Within three months, they will begin to forage alone at sea. <laughs> Cape gannets also thrive on the Benguela's bounty. Their young are about to launch their first flight into independence. This chick now learns from the adults. His peers are warming up. But he is still building up courage. The most difficult part is to clear the surf. Mother seals must replenish their milk. Now they leave their pups alone. The gannet chick is still struggling to take off. And the sea seems so unpredictable. Mammals and birds alike take to the ocean to feed. The seal needs to tear the bird apart before it can swallow such a large prey. Most of the chicks succeed and now they are free to fly. Seal pups are often left alone for days. 
Driven by hunger, the lonely pup wanders through the colony in search of its mother. Although surrounded by half a million seals, the pup's cries will not be heard. For black-backed jackals, the breeding season is a time of plenty. They prowl the beaches and home in on the desperate cries of lost pups. The only way the jackal can kill the pup is by cutting off its air supply. It can take the jackal half an hour to kill the pup. But the mother has returned. Jackals have great respect for mother seals. This one's lost the battle. Saved by its thick skin, the pup is bruised, but otherwise unharmed. Eventually, the heat of summer wanes and the weather finally turns. Powered by the same current that nourishes these waters, great Antarctic storms break onto the land. fearsome winds, but also the secret driving force of Namaqua land. Winter rains. Life-giving rain. The key to unlocking the wonders of Namaqua land. With the kiss of rain, Mesam seed capsules burst into life, releasing their seeds instantly. Then, stone plants awaken, erupting through their toughened skins. Set amongst the quartz pebbles of Namaqua land, living jewels once again begin to shine. The stone plants break their disguise and flower now at the very brink of winter. They will be pollinated by the few hardy beetles who are able to withstand the cold. Although the rains have brought life back to the soil, 
The meerkats must bask in the sun before they can face the cold mornings. Now, in the chill of winter, the quiver trees start flowering. They draw on the water reserves in their soft branches to produce early flowers. Seed-eating weaver birds are not above stealing the nectar. But it is the sunbirds like this malachite that the aloe desires as its prime pollinator. A regular meal of sweet nectar to stave off the cold of winter is an opportunity not to be missed, so the quiver tree is guaranteed of having its flowers pollinated at this time of year. At night, another early pollinator is tempted out of hiding by the promise of nectar. Because of a large underground bulb, this plant has a store of moisture to enable it to flower out of season and to monopolize the attentions of the short-tailed gerbil. By coating the gerbil's whiskers with pollen, this plant is one of the only ones to achieve pollination by a mammal. The rains have laid a soft hue of green across Namakwa land. Amongst the ostriches, preparations are afoot to time the arrival of a new clutch of chicks with the next blooming of the desert garden. In full breeding plumage, a male begins his seduction. The female is impressed by his inviting feathery display. After a few minutes of mutual admiration, she accepts. The changing seasons have brought a spirit of new life to the meerkats. Although only the dominant pair mate, the playful courtship involves a whole group. And 
now, finally, these residents of Namaqualand can look forward to a bountiful spring. Driven by ferocious storms, the coastal mists push inland, providing precious moisture. Once barren, now the saturated soils burst into life. As the spring sun disperses the mist, its rays bring the delicate touch of new life. The miracle of Namaqualand begins. Now the moisture and the warmth of the sun bring life to the wild desert garden. Out of the desolation of the desert, the flowers put forth buds which explode into bloom. Sown by the winter rains, nurtured by the spring sun and driven by competition for insect pollinators, the flowers of Namaqualand erupt into a palette of every colour imaginable and unimaginable. Once again, the desert transforms into the most spectacular garden on earth. <laughs> 